Hello there, this is Andy Ewans from FormerServe once again. A bit different this one, and a bit longer, on this topic of containers on the IBM i. This video was originally produced for the i user group in the UK, the IUG, and includes all the topics that were shown there. I hope you enjoy it. Stay safe and keep washing those hands. I can hear everybody asking, what the are containers. That's a good place to start. Hopefully at the end of this session that question will be well and truly answered and we won't need to have any censored bleeps. The topics I intend covering today are what are containers? What are containers on IBM i? How do we create containers? How do we install software in our containers and use them? getting users to automatically use a certain container. Using utilities, how do we back up, copy, move and manage containers? What about our development environments? What support options do we have for containers? Are IBM going to turn around and say, nothing to do with us? And on to the first one on the list. In this topic, we will discuss containers in general, where they have come from, where they are now, and then we will explain containers on the IBM i. Where are we going with virtualization? The whole point is to have some level of isolation, your own little bubble. Where have we heard those words recently? Let me start a whiteboard session, as they say, a picture paints a thousand something or others. If we look at traditional virtual machines, you have your machine, this is a server, it can be a desktop, you have your infrastructure layer, the hardware, then we have the host operating system, and then with a the virtual server we have the hypervisor layer. There are a couple of different hypervisors, I haven't really got time to go into this, so the different types. I'm sure Google can give you all the info you need there. Then we have the guest operating systems, the guest OS's. So in any particular one virtual machine, we will have three VMs. You could have Windows running here. We could have Linux. And here we could have AIX and so on and so forth. Then on the top of your operating systems, you have your binaries and the library layer. You have that all across the board. Then you have your applications, all isolated applications on a virtual machine. Here we have app one, app two, app three. This is all in the VM world. Then we're going to have the container options. The first two layers are the same. We have the infrastructure, the hardware. You have your host operating system, the host OS. And then the difference here is instead of a hypervisor, we have a container runtime. It could be something like Docker Daemon or something similar. Other products are available. Whatever is controlling the process for your container environment. So instead of having the guest OS layer here, you are going to use the host operating system and share it amongst your environments. And that leads us on to a big difference here. You end up with fairly lightweight containers that can use everything in the new host OS. Let me emphasize the lightweight containers here. So your binaries, stroke libraries, are going to be specific to the application that you are running, like you might deploy on a virtual machine, but now just packaged for the use of the application, but with a direct host OS access for shared resources. Then we have app one, app two, and app three, exactly the same at the top here. So the big difference with the containers way of working is they are lightweight. 
Looking at these two models, you could take all the containers here and drop them the whole set into one of the guest OS's in the VM world. We will then have three containerized environments on a single VM. From a development perspective, this is quite common. A lot of people do that. They have their virtual machines and they use them to build out their container systems. So if we're looking at the differences here, virtual machines are abstracting the physical hardware, turning one server into many servers. Whereas if we're looking at the container server, we're not making this more than one server. It is still just one server. We're just containerizing the applications so that we are packaging code and the dependencies, but that's it. Everything else is shared. And so for looking at size, a container, you're looking at a scale of megabytes. Whereas with the virtual machine, you're looking at the scale of gigabytes because it's got to have the entire host operating system involved in there. VMs are slow to start up, whereas containers are near instantaneous. A couple of milliseconds and it's up. If we take a look at patching, traditionally in the VM world, it's a case of I've got to back up that whole machine, that whole virtual machine and run any updates. In the container world, you're not doing any of that. In the container world, we patch or update our container image so that when we're ready to go, you just delete the container and install the new image. And this only takes a couple of milliseconds. Job done. In a nutshell, that's what containers are. Just little containers with the libraries and the binaries dependent for that application. You don't have to worry about if I'm on a desktop and I've got Node 8 installed. And if I deploy to a server out there in production, which might be on Node 12, and now everything doesn't work, you don't have to worry about that because your container images are going to include all the necessary packages that you need for your app to run. And so once that image is defined, you deploy the image in it and it's good to go. So that really was a short and brief, but it should give you an idea about what VMs and containers are all about. Now moving on to the IBM I way of containers. Containers on IBMI gives us what is called file system containers. Once again at the bottom, we have our hardware infrastructure, then our microcode TIMI layer, then the IBMI host OS, On top of that, we have the hierarchical file system, QSYS, and all our libraries. Then on the other side, we have our good old IFS, the root system. For containers, we have to be in the QOpenSYS file system. We then have our binaries. Then we have our applications. As we can see from the diagram, IBM I, totally different from containers on other servers. They do not include a guest OS like VMs and they do not include a container daemon. So they are just basically the binaries, libraries and the application. Yes, you could lift an IBM I container and restore it onto another IBM I, but you couldn't lift and shift it onto either a VM nor a container server. So limited at this time. Yes, but they are still very useful. I'm sure IBM has some future enhancements on containers for us. Haven't you IBM? Let me spend just a couple of minutes going over a topic that has had a lot of publicity for quite a few years now, Docker. Docker is a popular runtime used to create and build software inside containers. No, Docker is not yet available for our IBM I. One day, maybe. There is a request for enhancement on Docker. Has been open a few years now, but get voting for it. Docker is all about images. 
A container image is a portable package that contains software. It's this image, when run, becomes a container. Docker images are defined using a text file with a list of steps to perform to define your application and create a Docker image that makes your container. Let me show you a quick basic Docker file. We are going to look at creating a container that runs a PHP application. As the container requires everything that we need to run that application, the first thing we are going to need is a PHP runtime. And we're also going to need a Apache to provide the web serving for that application. Now we are going to fire up Visual Studio Code. I think I've plugged that enough lately in my videos on PowerWire. The first thing we want to do here, if we're working with Docker, is to find an extension for Docker. So we go to the extensions, we click on the extensions icon here, and put in the search word of Docker. The first one on the list there is a Microsoft extension. That looks good. It's got loads of stars, so we will install that. Now that is installed, it allows us to work with Docker inside Visual Studio Code. Makes life very handy. Let me create a new file, just a straightforward text file. One of the great things with Docker is being able to put images that have already been created for us. We need PHP and we need Apache. So the first thing we're going to do is use the from keyword to say where to get the Apache and PHP images. Loads and loads of these from the Docker website, whether you want PHP, you want Node, etc, etc. They're all on there. Then we are going to set the working directory. Then we copy over our application into the Docker image. Then we state which port we want to use for this application. So that's the port that the application is going to be listening on. And that's it in its basic form. We then create a Docker image from this text file and deploy that image. Our application will now be up and running in a container. If we have to make any changes to our application, we create a new image and deploy that. We cannot alter an image. They are read only. They are called nuke and pay for a reason. What a great term. While I'm in Visual Studio Code, don't forget to use some source control for your Docker images. My favorite, and for a few others, is Git. Start using Git, a great addition to your CV. Before we move on to using containers, let me go through the pros and cons of containers and let you decide if they have a benefit to your company. Let me start off with the pros. Containers are easy to create. It only takes a couple more steps to create a containerized directory than it does a standard directory on the IBM I. Isolation. You can be guarantee that your containers you are not going to mess up other directory contents. Environments. Use containers to isolate your developments. Have a container for development. Have a container for UAT. Have a container for Q&A. And if you haven't got a production helper, and not everybody has, create a production container that your users are automatically directed to. Proof of concept. We once used the container to prove to our client that we could go and get their company's emails from Gmail. He wasn't so impressed when we put all these emails up on the screen. Flexibility. Due to containers being much more lightweight, they can be copied, moved and backed up a lot quicker and a lot easier than having a complete helper. Playground. Want to have a playground? With all the new gizzits that IBM just keeps providing, create a container for it. For example, have a play around with zip and 7-zip. What do you find easier? Use a playground to get your open source knowledge bang up to date. Don't be stuck with only being an RPG developer. It doesn't wash these days, to be honest. Now let us move on to the cons. Security. 
Don't think that just because you are running your application in an isolated container, you need not worry about security. Security is as relevant in a container as it is in a normal library directory structure. Don't try putting the wall over your security team by pleading ignorance about security because it's in a container gov. IBMI containers are not Docker containers. Because IBMI containers bear no resemblance to either a Docker container nor a VM container. Once again, the IE is different. Being fully aware of the limitations I mentioned within this presentation before you can say one container is the same as the next. Open source updates. As I've mentioned in many of my open source presentations, just as you have procedures for installing new versions of IBMI and PTFs, you also need to include open source to those procedures. Now I'm saying you'll not only need to include open source to those maintenance procedures, but you need to include open source to your maintenance procedures and extend those procedures to include open source containers. Objects outside your container. Do not forget that your container can access all traditional IBMI objects. By that I mean the database, DB2, programs, data areas, and any other objects that do not reside inside your container. If your containerized application is updating a database table, think where else that table is being used, in test, in production, UIT. Hopefully this topic has given you a lot of considerations before going down the container route. So we've decided we need to use containers on the eye. And now I will run through what we need to do to create our first container. Let me fire up a shell session to our IBM I. I'll be using the fantastic Windows Terminal plug here for our videos. We have a video at learning.formaserve.co.uk that tells you all about the new Windows Terminal. I'll open up a new window that automatically connects to the I. IBM have provided a package called IBM Cheroot that greatly assists us with containers on the I. We need to load this package onto our box. There's two ways to do this. The first way is to use yum to install the software in a shell window. A quick yum install IBM I Cheroot will do the business. I'm not going to do that here, I'll use the other way. So we can also use ACS access for client solutions if you would prefer to use a GUI. Open up ACS and take the open source package management option from the tools drop down. Sign on to the box. Then select the IBM i Cheroot package. We can see here it's at version 2.1.3. I'll install it from here. It's now downloading all its dependencies so we don't have to worry about them. All complete. It's now on our list of installed packages. Result. Now we have the tools we need to create our first container. Back to our shell window. As all containers reside under QOpenSys directory on the IFS, I'll make a directory under there called containers. Then all our containers can live in one place. I'll move into the QOpenSys directory and make a directory there named containers. Next, I'll change over to the new directory. To create the cheroot, we run cheroot underscore setup and the name of the container we want. I'm going to call mine Andy, be nice and original. 
We take a Y for Yes to create an operational container. It's very minimalistic, but it gives us the shell commands we need to make a container operational. Always take this step, otherwise your container will be an empty directory and not usable. Bit of a waste of time. And that chugs through doing all its work for us. To enter the container, as it says on the screen, run the sharoot command. Sharoot open sys slash containers slash andy with q open sys slash usr bin sh. And there we are, we're into our container now. If I do pwd, it shows me at the root level of andy, so I'm at the top level now. It shows my contents from my root container. And that's it, our first container created. We can now create containers that will isolate our software and apps in their own unique sandbox environment. Now we have our container and can get inside it, we need to do something with it. On my server, I have Node8 installed. All our applications run using this version. We can see that here. If I want to test the functionality using the latest version of Node for our applications, I would create a container, install the latest Node, load our app and test it, all in isolation, not affecting the, in quotes, global Node 8 install. If I run node ver with the list parameter, we can see that we have node 8 installed here as the default, but we also have node 10 installed. I'm going to install node at version 14, the latest version at this time, into my container. Once again, we have two methods to install software into our containers. If you are happy with CLIs, we can use an SSH shell or if you prefer a GUI, we have the ACS option. Totally your choice. The end result is exactly the same. Firstly, the shell method. In a SSH session, we will use the yum command to install the latest version of Node, which is version 14.11, directly into my container. So we say yum with the parameter install root and that equals qopensys containers and andy as the name of my container and then install node.js 14 this is the method i would normally use but for this presentation i'll use acs now moving on to the acs method of installing software into our container just as we would be installing software into a standard container we use the acs tools then open source package management to install software into our container. Tick the box to install into a container. I'll put my Andy container in there. As we do not have any software installed yet, we get an error. Don't worry about this. It's worth mentioning at this stage, we can see we are in a container by the connection details on the top of the screen. Let me find Node.js 14 and install that. Word of warning, it does take a while to install the dependencies as this is a completely new install. As those who attended my open source package management presentation already know, Using yum will automatically track and trace all dependent contacts. See what I did there? See, I did say it takes a while. This part has been sped up four times. That has completed. All looks good to me. If we go to the installed packages now, we can see that node 14 is installed. Interesting to note, Node requires Python 3. No, I have no idea why. Back to our shell. Let me move into our container 
and check the version of Node. That looks good. Node is now running at version 14.11. Job done. This container cannot see anything outside the container gel. All very isolated, which is exactly what we want to achieve. Now we have our container with Node installed. Let me quickly write a Node program to ensure it's all working as we intend. I'll fire up VS Code and navigate to our container. Here we can see our container under QOpensys Containers Andy. I'll create a new file. We'll call it webserver.js. I'll use the HTTP module. Log some text to let us know it's running and the port number. Now use the HTTP functions to write out some stuff to the browser. Then listen on port 8080. And that will test node is running in our container. I'll open a shell session within VS Code using control apostrophe. Nice shortcut there. I'll SSH into our box. It signs on automatically for me. Navigate to our container. A quick ls to show the directory content. Make sure our new program is there, our node program. A quick cat cat will list it out. Then we'll use node to execute the script. We've got our first console message. Now we can go onto the browser, point it to our IBM I on port 8080, and there we go. Next, we will check we can access our database from within this container. I'll create a new file. This time I'll call it employee.js. I'll use the IDB connector, set our library, send a debug message. Now I'm going to create a function to access our employees, create the SQL string. Just a straightforward select. Then I'll execute this SQL string and show the results just to the console for this exercise. Outside of this function, we want to execute the employee function and catch any errors we may get. Switching over to a shell session, I'll run the node script. And we get an error. This is because we have not installed the database connector into our container. A quick npm install there will fix this. npm install idb p connector. That's installed in our database connector module. Try our program again. And here we go a list of all our employees. To recap, we created a container. We installed Node.js 14 inside it. We wrote a Node web serving program. And we wrote a Node program to access our employee database. Worked fine. Job done. That's how we install software and write software in our container. It's that easy. In this session, we will be looking at forcing a user profile directly into a container. Very useful for when a tester, for example, needs to prove that the application may be running a new version of Node.js is hunky-dory. I'm going to create a new user, James Riddell, or Jimmy Riddle as he's known. Cockney rhyming slang for anyone who didn't get it. They will be forced into my Andy container. Back to a 5250 session. Using the create user profile command, we will put in all the usual details, but for the home directory. We need to place them in the container. So home directory, q open sys, containers, Andy, specify the dot and then home. We specify the full stop as the root of the container. That's all done. Now we need to check it out. I'll sign on as good old Jimmy. Run the work link command without any parameters as the default takes the user into their home directory. So this is a good test. 
Here we can see we are in the container, in the Andy Containers home directory. Then we will start a QShell session, still in 5250. A PWD will give me the current directory location. Again, we can see we are in a container called Andy. I'll now start an SSH session. Cool, that's difficult to say. To our IBMI using James's profile. SSH Jimmy Rudel at Galatea. I'll enter his password. That shows we are in a bash session. That's even more difficult to say. A PWD shows me I'm in the home directory. No files in there. Let's move up a level. CD dot dot. A PWD now shows I'm at the root level of the container. I'll list out all the contents of the root. We can tell we are still in the container as there is no qsys.lib directory. Job done. Our user is now forced into that container. He is now in his own little world. As Jesse would say, he's in jail. Moving on to saving and restoring containers. All the normal save and restore commands work as you would expect with containers. For instance, to save a container, I would use the SAV command. If I wanted to restore that container, I would use the RST command. If I wanted to restore the container onto another box, I would use the SAV RST command. I'm sure you're all familiar with these commands, so I won't spend any time on those. But what I will spend time on is another alternative to those commands. You've probably not heard of it. It's called rsync, remote synchronization, a true favorite of ours. Copying files from one IFS location to another can easily be achieved by using the CP command, the copy command. Sometimes it would be handy if the CP command could do a little more. And this is where rsync comes in, especially when you are transferring larger files. Some of the benefits of rsync are, can be used to copy files onto our IFS. It allows synchronization of files. It can be used to synchronize files over the network to another IBMI can be scheduled to allow nightly backups. Synchronization is a huge advantage of rsync that instead of blindly copying the whole content, instead it analyzes and transfers only the differences between the source and the destination, saving system resources, bandwidth and critically time. So what is the syntax for rsync? Very simple. Every function of this utility starts with rsync. Then we have the options parameter, which is prefixed with a minus. Then we have the source directory. And then we have the destination directory. And that's it, as I said, all very simples. And an example is where we are copying the directory Andy to the backups directory. Let me move on to the options we have. I always use the minus A, V, H and Z, which is A is keeping all those file attributes when copying owner, security, date it was created, etc, etc. V is for verbose login. H is for a human readout, as they state. It will convert bytes into gigabytes, use thousand separators, etc, etc. And Z is for compression. There are more if you need them. They can be found on the rsync website along with lots and lots of examples. Firstly, we have to install rsync. Remote sync is available as a package to download using the normal open source methods we have used earlier, whether it's ACS or YUM. We can see I have it installed at version 3.1.2. To check we have it installed from a shell session, we run rsync minus minus version. 
we should see it's at version 3.1.2. That's lucky. Let me show you some examples of using rsync. I'll copy my Andy directory to our backups directory. rsync minus A, V, H and Z. The Andy directory and the backups directory. And away it goes. That's all done. Let me check the copy. For those of you who only trust green screen, let me bring up the backups directory. Here we can see the Andy directory. Take a look inside that. And we can see all the subdirectories and files have been copied over, keeping their, all their original attributes. If I run the same command again, it will check to see if there are any changes. If so, it will only copy over the newer files. No changes found here, so no copying done. To show how rsync would only copy over new or change files, I'll fire up Visual Studio Code and add a new file to my Andy directory. I'll call it rsync.txt and add some useless text to it. And now try the rsync command again. Yes, it's only copied over my rsync.txt file. Let me go back to the 5250 session, run the work link command on backups, put a 5 alongside that, put a 5 alongside rsync.txt, and that is all been copied over fine. If I want to copy my directory over to another partition, the syntax is very easy to follow. Only the destination parameter needs to be changed to use SSH to transfer to our other partition. I'll back up and restore my Andy directory over to the other partition named Proteus in the backups directory there. So the syntax is rsync minus z avh minus minus progress slash andy and then andy at proteus as the ssh part then using the colon slash backups this time i've added the progress parameter that shows the copy progress as it goes along that's all done I'll start up a 5250 session on our other partition. Change into the backups directory. And there we have our Andy copy. R synced all the way over. All very simple. I could then add a scheduled job to run every night to back up my IFS directory. Hopefully that's giving you insight into another method we can use, rsync, within our IFS. So, rsync, not directly applicable to containers, but a great general IFS tool to have on your server. It's worth making use of it. Moving on to support. Yes, IBM does support containers and installing packages using ACS or YUM into a container. It will not support your application running in a container, just as it does not into a normal directory library scenario. While we're here, let me have a quick word about general open source support. So, if you need support on open source, where do you go? If you have an IBM software maintenance, it does include support for the install of RPM packages. So if you have any problems with a package that will not install, give IBM a call. OpenSSH and OpenSSL are also included in SWMA. I do love their logo. Apache HTTP Server are also included in SWMA. Then we have community support, as in free. Defects can be raised on IBM's community channels such as GitHub and Bitbucket. Also, good advice is to help with communities. Have key personnel, usually developers, 
join the community ecosystems built around the products you use. If Node is your choice, join the many Node communities, for example, which is exactly like we did with Zend, helping them test Zend Server on the IBM I for a new release. Get developers, reviewers, or testers involved. Keep up with the latest discussions in the various forums. Can be very, very useful. Many companies provide commercial support if that's what you require. As you would expect, there is no support from IBM for the original license program for open source 5733 OPS. That's long gone. IBM has recently increased its area of support for open source packages. Give them a ring if this appeals to you. Reach out to us. We are always willing to help with our passion for open source on IBM I. And that wraps up this quick video. Thank you for watching our How To on IBM I video set. I hope you found them useful. Keep checking our website learning.formalserve.co.uk and our YouTube channel. We regularly add new ones. Stay safe and see you soon.